Okay, so we're just going to land here in the space, here at uh, the San Francisco Dhamma Collective beautiful space in the mission in San Francisco. And there's a few people here. Let me count. Eight people, nine people, including Noam, and 10, including me. So that's lovely. And, and uh, the two, three of you online, four of you online. So lovely to see you too. And that's, as Noam said before, that's going to be my last session here in person. But we're going to continue with online teachings at least you know, to, to, to the end of November. In December, uh, we teach a retreat so I can't come. And, and then we can see if we want to continue next year or not. It really depends how many people are, are participating, you know. And uh, because I also teach, hello, Sheila, nice to see you too, because I do quite a few other online teachings as well. And rather than uh, having so many separate, you know, where there is only a small attendance, I, I do a bit less and then people can attend there or, uh, you know, um, take the recording because it's, it's a better use of my energy as I'm getting older my energy is also kind of diminishing a little or changing, you know, and I can't anymore put out so much. I put out in a different way now, you know, not anymore through uh, physical exertion <laughs> because that's, it's just not really, a, it's just not really so good for me. And uh, so, yeah. So usually, you know, we are starting with, uh, the three refuges and the, and the five precepts. And any of you, you know, who know what that is, you can, you can join in. And do you have handouts or should they just look at the screen? Yes. So Tia, you're just gonna, and make it really big Tia, so that people here who sit in the space and who don't know it by heart, can join us as well. And is there anyone here, you know, who doesn't know what that is? Three refugees and five precepts. Do you know? Do you know? Buddha Dhamma Sangha, yeah, yeah. But also, you know, you, if you are not really uh, know what it is, maybe you just observe today, you know, and then at, a, at another time, uh, you can take them because it's not such a good idea to just ad hoc, you know, take it. And also it would take too much time for me to explain right now. There will be maybe sometimes a session, you know, where that is explained and then you can learn about it. It's the, it's the foundation of Buddhist practice, you know. Actually, if we want the practice to really go somewhere, it needs to be based on that. Otherwise, it's more like a one step forward, two steps back, and so on. But it, we, one needs to familiarize oneself with it first. Okay. So for those who want to join in, it's it's available on the screen. And I'm just going to chant the Namotasa. That's the homage to the Buddha. I chanted first. And then we can do the refugees call and response and the precepts as well. Okay. <clears throat> and if anyone, you know, wants to join in with the Namo Tassa with me, you're of course welcome. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa. And that's just an acknowledgement you know, of the teacher from whom this teaching comes down to us. And now we start with the refugees, and I read it first on my own, and then you can repeat it back to me, okay? Bhutang Saranangachami. Tamang Saranangachami 
Sankang Saranang Gachami Tutiampi Putang Saranang Gachami Tutiampi Tamang Saranang Gachami Tutiampi Sankang Saranang Gachami Tatiampi Putang Saranang Gachami Tatiampi Tamang Saranang Gachami Tati Ampi Sankang Saranang Gachami And now we do the five precepts and again, you know, I read it out first and then you can repeat after me. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from false and harmful speech. And I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. Thank you. Imani Panchasika Padani Samadiani, Silena Sukatinyanti, Silena Boka Sampata, Silena Niputinyanti Tasma Silang Visotaye. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Okay. You know, that's just an acknowledgement that you're giving the gift of fearlessness, you know, to yourself and also to the world. So the precepts are this great gift, you know, which you give to yourself and to others. Great, you know, great thing to do in this world today where there's so much suffering, you know, and craziness. So that's a very good, very good way to start with any anything based on that is a good thing. Yay. <laughs> good. So... So let us just like land here a little bit more. And I see that more people have joined. Hello, hello. I know most of you from before. So let us just, you know, bring not only the body into the space, but also the mind and the heart. By just, you know, sensing the body sitting on the cushion, on the chair, you know, sensing the weight of the body. This is gently, you know, pulled towards planet Earth through gravity. And even, you know, we're sitting here in a house in the mission in San Francisco, there's still soil underneath all of this. The planet, a living, intelligent being, which we are part of. And, you know, if we are city dwellers, it's, it's much easier to get really quite disconnected from the fact that we are part of nature because we see so much you know, concrete and gray, but still underneath it all, there is this living planet and all of the pits and pieces, you know, which have been building this city 
they are all coming from planet Earth. Just remembering that. You know, the, all the great uncertainty with you know, which we are confronted these days, which is kind of more intense than just a few years ago. You know, as we are witnessing that systems start to crumble and certain assumptions we had about the future, you know, they are no longer so sure as just a few years ago. And that's how things are going at this point. You know, great changes and transition time. And there's not much we can do about that, but we can learn skillful ways of of meeting it. That's where our agency lies, in the way we are meeting it. And that on the long term will also, of course, have an effect on to what's happening. So the whole Buddhist teaching actually is about that. You know, how do I relate to my experience? How do I deal with my experience? That's what the Buddhist teaching is all about. And, you know, it's a very ancient teaching, which has come to us from Iron Age India. And the essence of the teaching, the liberating essence of the teaching is as valid, as applicable as it has you know, been 2,500 years ago. But the context within which we are living it and integrating it has changed very much. The issues these days, in particular in regards to the climate crisis is unprecedented in history of humanity. So it's a huge uh, mirror for us where we can see, you know, that indeed, you know, all actions have repercussions, intentional and unintentional even. They have repercussions. And we are well, well advised, you know, to take an interest in that law. We just can't, you know, hope that somebody else is going to clean up that mess we have been collectively making. You know, in our ignorance and uh, misguidedness, you know, being guided by comfort and You know, setting things in motion, which we didn't know how it would create repercussions, which are now becoming more and more interlocking. So you know, as we are hearing this, to just connect with your own bodies and uh, sensing into the body, you know, but just not being up in the head, thinking about what you've heard, but just sensing into the body, what are you aware of? And then allowing your breath to take you into the body. And you don't have to work hard, but just connecting, you know. 
not thinking about it, but noticing your direct experience. And taking a screenshot of your inner experience, you know, not only the body, also emotions and um, thinking. And what you're bringing here, what you're bringing to this meeting. And the practice is really all about the capacity to connect to your experience and not giving in to the knee-jerk response of just going up into the head, thinking about something else, thinking about what you just ate or what you're going to eat in the future or, you know, any kind of story which is pulling you right now. Just, you know, not allowing that to happen and coming back to the simplicity of sensing. And then there may be the, you know, noticing how the mind is struggling, you know, because the mind always wants to interpret everything that gives us a sense of security if we don't allow that to happen. We need to stay with the discomfort of direct experience. And that's exactly what is needed, you know, for this practice to be transformative, to really unlock the transformative potential of the practice is we need to stay with the direct sense experience. Even, you know, that's something we find difficult to do. But that is what, you know, opens it all up and allowing more space around that sense experience. If you notice, you know, that the mind is like craving for something because it doesn't want to stay in that uncertainty, then just, you know, bringing some more kindness to that struggle. That's something we can do without giving in to thinking again. And that's, you know, that is a building resilience. Because, you know, this uncertainty is just like rea real, you know, but the way how we relate to it, that is something we can learn to do skillfully. And through the fact, you know, that these bodies are made of the elements, just the same elements that, as planet Earth is made of and the whole cosmos for that matter. That is our inroad into connecting with this much vaster intelligence, which the human mind really can't fathom because it's much too small and not able, you know, to really understand, but we can connect in on a different level through the, through the body.
So really allowing the awareness to descend into the body. You know, being aware of your toes, the feet, maybe even the ground underneath your feet. They are touching the ground and just stay there. And then you notice probably power of habit, you know, sends it up again into the head. As soon as you're noticing it, you're gently without any pressure coming down again. Coming down to the ground. You know, noticing the the bones in the in the body, the skeleton, the hardness, or maybe you know your teeth. You can bite your teeth together and feel that hardness. That's the earth element, which you know permeates the whole body. It's no different than from the mountain and the rocks, you know, on the planet. The soil is the same earth element. And, you know, if we don't eat earth elements through taking in food for one or two months, the body is going to shut down. And just to really allow that to sink in you know the body isn't just a separate entity the body is constantly in exchange with the planet not only through eating but also drinking the body has 75 percent water drinking water from the rivers and lakes the rain and the oceans and if we don't drink for five days or so, body shuts down. Never cuts the umbilical cord to the mother, the planet itself. And the fire element. You know, body needs to have a certain temperature in order to exist. If it's too little, it freezes. If it's too much, it evaporates. And, you know, we can manipulate it a little through closing and heating and housing. But nevertheless, you know, it's very vulnerable. And the heat element comes, the fire element comes from the sun on this planet. And then the wind element, the breathing process. And if we don't, you know, breathe in for three to seven minutes, then the body shuts down again. So this deep, deep interbeing between the biosphere and the body. That's something we need to really understand in order to live differently. That's the most urgent insight to have, I think, for us homo sapiens at this point in history. That's a, an evolutionary threshold which we are standing on now as a species and 
a certain percentage of the population needs to realize that, then it will just, you know, enter mainstream. But first, a certain percentage of people need to really get it through taking an interest. Not being so lost, you know, in a personal likes and dislikes, but also really taking interest in the, in the bigger picture, who we really are, how embedded we are in a much larger much larger, you know, team of species. And we are not special. We're just one of many. You know, and as you're hearing those words, just becoming aware how the body responds. You know, is there like a tightening or like a kind of, oh, that sounds really crazy or what? We just heard a very beautiful church bells here. They took that as a a yes, you know. <laughs> so yes, this is really true. Yes, we are part of nature. We are not separate. We are not masters of nature. And all of these old narratives, they have to just, you know, they get composted and they're going to be raw material for an updated version. And that happens just from time to time and the history books are full of it. And now such a time has come again. It's quite amazing to be conscious of that. You know, when Kepler and Galilei were speaking about, you know, that the Earth is not in the center, but the Earth is like moving around the sun. There were many people who were thinking, this is crazy. But now it's, nobody has any doubt about that anymore. But it took some time to have that integrated. And there were many stakeholders, you know, who didn't want to know of it particular the church. But now it's it's a non brainer. Or the earth is flat. Or many other, you know, assertions which turned out to be wrong. But because of the immaturity and the self obsessedness, you know, people didn't have the capacity to see a vaster context. But then any time you know, we mature, and that often has a lot to do with being able to deal with discomfort. If we, if we try to, you know, get around that by distracting ourselves through, you know, 
drugs and alcohol and overeating and sex or whatever, shopping, so many things we can do to distract ourselves from pain, then we're going to stay immature. And if we can, you know, allow that to be part of life because it simply is, then we will be more in coherence with reality. And that's, you know, what the three refugees are all about. I spoke about in the beginning. And how hard that is, you know, to arrive at this acceptance of uncertainty and change and discomfort. that there's nothing wrong with all of that. And then you're learning to differentiate what is just the way it is and what can be changed. Some things can't be changed and others can be. You know, as we hear those words, we can just um, you know, allow ourselves to feel how that feels and then relaxing without breath. And relaxing out into the space of this room, which doesn't end at the walls, but it's limitless space. The whole universe it's contained in that space, which is expanding.
And so being aware of the spaciousness. You know, listening into the spaciousness. And then just we can you know bring up in our heart an image or a sentence you know of memory of somebody who is having a lot of suffering these days or an, a situation and you know wishing them or wishing the situation well. May all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. That's another you know, classic sentence for metta or loving kindness. May all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. And just uh, gently allowing it to radiate out in front of you, you know, from the heart area. May all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. And then, you know, radiating to the side and behind and the other side, above and below, just sitting in an orb of metta or loving kindness. May all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. And just noticing, you know, how the mind, how the heart feels when it's quite open and not grasping anything. The subtle contentment or joy which is there. Which we all, you know, really appreciate that experience, but we are looking for it in the wrong places. We look for it in, in having and owing and possessing, but it comes from true joy, comes from letting go. And it sounds kind of counterintuitive, but it really is. If we can notice, you know, how the quality of the mind when it meditates in this way. A certain you know opening and relaxation happening from not holding on to anything. Not holding on to a thought, not holding on to a possession. Just 
just dropping everything. Then dropping the meta as well and just becoming aware of that which knows about the spaciousness of the mind, the knowing itself for awareness, just being conscious, being conscious awareness, like a mirror, you know, becoming aware of its own capacity to reflect effortlessly any object, you know, which comes in front of it. Just connecting with that capacity directly. Like making a U-turn, the mind looking at itself. Not thinking about it, but allowing it to naturally be. And if you notice your mind starts scrambling, just uh, let it do, let it be. There's nothing which needs to be done. Then soon we're gonna come to the end of the meditation. So maybe you know if the mind is really spacious, coming back and connecting with the body more, grounding again. So, is this on? Is this on? Yeah, 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 okay. So, you know, I want to give a bit of space for, for some Q&R, if there are any, before I you know, rattle on just with anything. <laughs> I would rather want to know what people would like to know. And if I know it, I would even share it. But if nobody has any idea what I should speak about, I can just speak about something. But let's see. Yeah.
the open mind? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Oops, yeah. Uh -huh. That's good. So that's you know that's like it's it's a it's a I don't know how it's like a step by step process you know and and yes I mean you can observe it you know and then and then uh, at one point you know you you drop the space as as an object of observation as I you know I guided us like that at the end you drop the space. And then the mind will still stay spacious, you know, because if if space is limitless, for the mind to really be aware of the limitlessness of space, it has also has to be limitless, okay? Because otherwise it couldn't, you know? And then if you drop the spaciousness, which was just a, a tool to open the mind, you know? And then you drop the spaciousness as an object, and then the mind still stays open, at least for some time, you know. And then you uh, you basically give the instructions, you know, that the mind becomes conscious of it, of its, of its capacity to know. Can you follow me? Yeah. And 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 it is a manner of speaking only, you know, because it it's we need to speak in dualistic language, of course, you know, because that's all we've got. So then you are. A way to describe it is that you you give the mind the instructions, you know, kind of to turn back on itself. And that's as good as it gets in terms of trying to describe it, you know what I mean? And then you, you could say, you know, that the mirror, the, because the mind is often, you know, compared with a mirror, well, or sometimes it's also with the sky, you know, it's like limitless. And then whatever object arises in front of a mirror or which object, you know, which moves through the sky, a cloud, a bird or whatever, you don't need to grasp it. You know, you can just let it go through and then it disappears again, you know. But whatever object, you know, goes past the mirror, the mirror reflects it, but it doesn't hold on to it. You know what I mean? And the mirror doesn't need to struggle in order to mirror anything. It's just its nature. You know what I mean? So, and this is what we want to recognize about the mind too, that the mind has different capacities or qualities and its most outstanding quality is the capacity to know. You know, like a mirror reflects an object, it doesn't have to do anything. The mind just knows, you know. Because when I sit here, depending on where I turn my awareness, I either can be aware of the weight of my body on that cushion. I can be aware of the tightness of my belt. I can be aware of the sound on the street. I can be aware of seeing people here in the, depends on where I, where I put my awareness. I can, to a certain extent, be aware of several things at the same time, or at least it appears to be. You know what I mean? And then, and through that exercise, you know, what what you are basically training is the capacity. Like, for example, if I'm, I'm aware now of the spaciousness of my mind, you know, and then, then I, somebody goes by out there and says, you idiot or something, you know. And then, because my, the capacity, you know, of the spaciousness is, is not so easily disturbed anymore these days. There is more space around whatever somebody would say, you know, and then I can choose, you know, how I want to respond. Whereas if their mind is not trained, you know, it immediately holds on to, well, why do you say this, you know, and something like that. And then the spaciousness, you know, gives the room that whatever appears can take its natural course, you know, like, like the seasons or whatever, you know, they arise and cease. I don't need to necessarily do always something about it. Sometimes we need to do something about it, but not always, you know. Whereas, you know, if we don't have that spaciousness, we can't see conditionality. We can't see how it all kind of interweaves with each other, but we immediately want to, no, you know, don't do this or we 
that shouldn't be like this and all of those things. Yeah. And, and the meditation is just like, um, you know, it's when you go to the gym and you train certain muscles, you know, you, you, you train that muscle of expanding the mind. And then once you have acquired the taste of the expansive mind, then you're much more aware also of how it feels if the mind is contracted, you know, and then like warning thing, boom, 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 you know, contracted. Be careful, you know, because now you might easily want to, you know, kick out and get rid of the discomfort of that contraction. And then we say things or, or, or you know, eat something or drink something in order to relieve ourselves from the discomfort. And then we become uh, addicted to that, you know, because we have no resilience to, to, to be with the discomfort, which is just like part and parcel of being alive, you know. There has never been anyone alive for more than an hour, you know, who hasn't had any discomfort, I don't think. And that's one of the things, you know, in our culture where it's all about comfort is a thing, you know, if you can't manage it, you either don't have enough money or buy the wrong products or whatever, you know. It's it's like, it's a, a dream, you know, which is perpetuated to a crazy extent, you know, which is actually, you know, make a lot of harm. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Anybody else a question on Zoom also? Yeah. See it here, there's somebody. I think you have to unmute yourself and then you can speak. I hope I hear you. No? Just got it. Otherwise, Tia, you can also read it out if, if it's written in the chat. You can also write it in the chat. And then either no more or Tia can read it. You should be able to unmute now. I'm sorry. I, I thought I undid it, but I did it. I apologize. Don't have don't worry. Yay. Hi. Hi everybody. Nice seeing you. Nice seeing you, Santa Chita. We're happy. Yeah. That, we're happy that you're here. I wonder. Yeah. I wanted to know what you think of something more practical. Um, I've heard many times during the teachings uh, this thing about accepting things as they are, accepting yeah. reality as it is. And I wanted to know what you think about what happens when you feel that you need a change, that the reality that is a, you are supposed to accept is something that you that you meditated on and you thought about and you don't like and you think that there's a, a, a need for a change for, mm -hmm. for but not some I'm not speaking about like something very you know mundane more like a state of being that you know that is not good for you or a state uh -huh. of things in your life that need to be changed. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, that's, you know, it's not about we, but I think, you know, we accept things as they are in the moment and then we can see about what we can do to change certain things, you know, which are unskillful, harmful, you know, uh, like a waste of time and all of those things. Yeah, definitely. But it's good, you know, to come from a point that we first accept the situation and not, you know, do like a knee jerk, uh, you know, reaction, but rather a response. You know, there's a difference between a reaction and a response. And that says it all, you know, to respond is more like, you know, to have a choice. And then, you know, to make them take some space and then do it skillfully, you know, and have, have maybe some patience also, you know, but it's, it's very individual, you know, sometimes we have to just cut it off like this and it's, you know, you can't say like a, a one fits all solution, but that it comes from, from some care, you know, 
care for one's own well-being and also the well-being of everyone involved in it, you know. But definitely, you know, accepting reality doesn't mean that I'm going to be a doormat or, or, or that I'm going to be stupid or something, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But this difference between the reaction and respond, response, responding, you know, I think that's important, you know, and I'm sure you know the difference, you know. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. During my say it's not I don't want to say often, but it happened from my mind to sister. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A battle, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, because what would the body want to do? Move or what? Uh, like today, it just didn't want to relax. What? Yeah. Try to relax the body. And my skin crawl. Uh huh. And it kind of made my muscles hurt. Yeah. The body just just. Yeah. We yeah. can't. We can't hear what he, what they're saying in the room. Can you okay. please? Okay. Oh, yes. Yes. Please. So somebody here in the room said, you know, that when he, when he sometimes, you know, when he sits down for meditation. And he'd like to yeah, try to relax his body. The body is just resisting, you know, it doesn't, it just doesn't want to. And now I'm just thinking about an, an answer. Um, and you know, when the first thing is, you know, the meditation posture isn't really, isn't really about only about relaxing, you know, it's a, it's, it's like a, a, a combo between alertness and relaxation. You know, not like super stiff, but also not kind of completely like that, you know. So it's like a, the middle way. And I think, you know, if, you know, there's some certain, let's say some certain habit patterns in your body, you know, still, which which you have to just sit through, I suppose, you know. How long are you meditating? How many years? Um, well, often on for maybe like, yeah, but, you know, it, 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 I have to be in a setting a lot, you know, and, uh, mm -hmm. five, 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 discipline, yes. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you know, it's it's just there's it's probably like you know, certain tensions and certain habit patterns in your body. Where where you just need to put in the footwork, you know, of of digesting it, and then what you can do is is to just remember, you know, meditation isn't about all about relaxing either, you know. So maybe I see how you sit, you know, you sit a bit like that, you know. I would say just you know don't lean against the back of the chair, just don't put your main thing into relaxing, but just like taking your seat, you know. I'm taking my seat. I'm here, you know. And I know who I am. I feel myself. And and I, it's not about like, you know, like when I, let's say I come back, which I don't do actually, but it's just an image, you know, I come back Friday evening from work and then I, I hang out in front of the TV and have like whatever, you know, and relaxing. That's not meditation. No. Meditation is, is more about, you know, really being full in your body and taking your seat where you are right now and meeting, you know, what's here. And if it's uncomfortable, then that's that, you know. And it's somehow, you know, it's it's a it's a clearing out, you know, of past habits. Maybe, you know, there were certain past habits you have cultivated, let's say, to relax, you know, and now you don't do that anymore. So now you meet all of the stuff, you know, which has been suppressed. And that's that's now your homework, <laughs> you know, however long it takes. Yeah. And that's what everybody has to do, you know, because you can choose, you know, I'm not going to do it. 
okay, then you do it at another time, but do not do it ever. It's not going to be, it's not possible. So, you know, so then you have to seek some support, you know, for example, for you, it works in a, in a group works much better. That, that makes a lot of sense. You know, this is where Sangha is one of the three refuges, you know, community, because to do hard things in community is much easier than doing it alone, you know? So you have to just stick it out, you know? But don't do it all on one day because it won't be, it could go crazy or whatever. You couldn't do it, you know? So you just bite off what you can chew, you know, and not more than that. And be hanging. It's, it's a long, it's a, it's a long thing, you know? I mean, I'm practicing like over 30 years and I'm still working on habits, you know? It's not going to be a quick fix, you know? That's that, you know? Yeah. It's the, you know, they say people in the beginning, we have this idea, you know, oh, you know, now we hit it on this practice, you know, and it's wonderful. That's like the honeymoon phase. And then once you have a foot in the door, then the kitchen sink phase starts. It can take many years, you know, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, whatever. And this is, this is this like, you know, going through the, habitual patterns and 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 washing them out you know they become less and less powerful so if you look back over 10 years you can certainly see some changes i suppose huh sure. yeah but if you just look after back after 10 weeks you won't see a change you know so that's you have to take it that we are in here for the long haul you know yeah and there was, uh, I, I forgot your name, but the lady with the red glasses, you could now say something if you like. Yeah, it's Carol. Hi. Hi, Hi. Carol. I remember you. Yeah, we yeah. saw each other this past year. I'm so happy to see you. It's beautiful where you are. This is a beautiful space. Yes, um, it is. Um, I had a, a couple of thoughts and um one is I've been practicing with the element using elements practice now for a while and recently um really feeling um the sensation is like an absorption and a dissolution at the same time. I'm a little confused, but I think it feels like in the right direction where I I don't feel a separate uh, um I feel like the boundaries dissolve a little around mm -hmm. the elements not around me but around the like uh the weight and heft and material part with the earth and the soil and you know that and then the the liquid element just really feeling like the water element um and it's making me it's leaving me in a non-meditative state <laughs> I always felt close um, to nature, but it's connected me in a different way because mm -hmm. I can feel going through the body instead of like coming up against the body from the outside. It feels more like one thing. I don't want to get woo-woo, but that's that's the experience. <laughs> and the, the question I have, I have a question, and, and I don't want to. I don't want to make this an academic question. In the meta practice, you know and the sending out to all sentient beings, there, to me, a very limited definition of sentient. And I experience the world like now, again, many years, I'm do meta, I, I feel a sentience in the non-sentient, what, what we call non-sentient, you know, the rocks, the water, the, mm -hmm. when you call it like an intelligent, it feels responsive, even when we talk about that mirror image lately, even that, I know what it means. It means it doesn't mm -hmm. have references, you know, that kind of consciousness. But I'm also feeling the mirror is impacted in some essential way, in an elemental way by what, by what it, you know, what meets it. It's not mm -hmm. just passive, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um those are two thoughts. And then I just wanted to share in the chat, there's a film that's kind of old now. It's called Dirt. And I don't know if anybody here has seen it. But when you were doing the Earth um, element today, I I remembered it from, it's I think 2007, 2009. It just came to mind that I 
I want to just put the link in the chat if anybody wants to look it up and watch it someday. It's just about mm -hmm. earth and the dirt. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I also think, you know, that the elements are sentient themselves, you know, yeah. otherwise the, 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 the planet wouldn't be a, a living intelligence being, yeah. And, and just, you know, and, and there's different philosophies, some people, some, you know, uh, some teachings say this and then some say this, but I mean, you can just, if you, if, if for you it is sentient, then that's what it is, you know. To me, it's important because it also changes the way people interact, you know, with the elements in the earth. If one considers there's a consciousness or a sentience or. Yeah, but this is. Yeah, that is exactly what it, as I can as, I think I said, you know, that's the learning curve we are in now as a species, yeah. you know, yeah. to basically change our views about all of this, you know, because we had a. You know, we, we, uh, we, all of us here, you know, in the ages we are, we have been conditioned in that, you know, mind over matter worldview, you know, and that we can be objective observers outside of an experience looking at it and then saying something about it, you know. And now, I mean, I've seen it a long time, but it hasn't really entered the mainstream narrative. We are very clear, you know, we are influencing whatever we are observing because we are part of what we are observing. Mm -hmm. You know, and quantum physics has shown us that already, but it hasn't really, it's not really integrated in our education, you know, mainstream education. We still think, you know, we can be outside of something and observe it objectively. And, you know, there's like a God, you know, hovering somewhere outside and observing us and judging us and all of that stuff, you know, that's very deep in our unconscious because of the cultural conditioning. Yeah. And now it's about like making that paradigm shift, you know, and, yeah. and many, many parts of people need to start working on this, you know, so that it might then, you know, get integrated into mainstream culture if there's a certain percentage of the population has understood it, you know? And and we are working on that. I suppose I'm definitely part of that uh, of that un undertaking, you know? And that's why I also started the Earth Room because I think that's the most important work to do right now and support for people because all solutions which are coming out of the old, old narrative won't be really sustainable, you know, because the the consciousness which created the issue can't solve it. It needs to come from a deeper understanding of who we are. And that comes through, uh, you know, besides other things, through contemplating our non-separation, you know, from the planet. Because then there will be, uh, you know, through the, the repetition of it, like learning a new skill, you know, like learning to play an instrument or driving a car, whatever, you need to do it a long time for, to be proficient in it. But then at one point, you know, you can drive and eat the sandwich and talk at the same time. When the beginning, you thought, I'm never going to be able to drive even to the next corner, you know, remember that? And And, and it's the same with this, you know. I just appreciate that so much in the earth room because <clears throat> I'm thinking, I think there are a lot of what I'm finding, there are a lot of people who have these sensitivities and connections, but the, the narrative has not allowed for that. And as I think there's like affinity people, it sounds like people are coming out of getting permission to say what their yes. experience has been yeah. called too sensitive or too serious or too this or too that, but it's to have places yeah people can hear something different and it resonates with what they already know, but they haven't really been encouraged to develop yeah. or say. So yeah. I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, I can also yeah. see that other people, you know, thinking along the same lines and so on and having the support, yeah, that's what it, what it needs, you know. And all, I think all, you know, updates in, in our civilization over the millennia, they always start with the small groups of people, you know, far apart, and then 
they start to connect up and so on, you know, and mm -hmm. it wasn't different over the, over the many, you know, like the, the history books of history books are full of it, you know? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yes. There's somebody else there. Uh, Sylvia, I think. Yeah. Okay, let me just tell you a little experience I had yesterday. I've been a person who always knew how to get to the places. It was like easy in my life. Like I didn't, I got, didn't get lost, and it it, it was um, quite easy for me to go from one place to another, from one state to another, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yesterday that we went where we we're at Land's End, we went up the mountain and we encountered this beautiful circle and there were little bo bottles, beautiful bottles all around sitting inside with the ashes of the, the people who have died working there and I guess around there. And uh, mm -hmm. I I didn't know how much touched I was on, until um, when we were going down the mountain, which we went up and it was like 10 minutes at, at most to get there. And suddenly uh, we got lost. And usually it's me who knows where to go. <laughs> so I have been very proud about that. Because I don't have too many things to to give, but <laughs> if these people who live around me don't, don't get lost. So here we are going around and around of places. And to go down, which took us like 10 minutes to go up, it took us like a half hour. And I had all the time this big the sense of of being lost and lost in the big mountain where nobody is nobody walks it was a day that nobody was around there i said oh my god <laughs> i'm gonna stay here forever with these people who are already there and never come down it was really like like a punishment for myself And we when we finally, Jean and I found the way, I guess it wasn't me who found the way, but it was really five minutes from where we went up. And when I was down, down the mountain, I said, oh my God, that's a big, big, big change in me. I got lost in a place where I shouldn't have been lost. And uh, we were coming down, we were coming to San Francisco, we were coming back to San Francisco. So Gina drove and I drove and we had a beautiful coming back and going in. But all the time it remained on me, the sensation of getting, of that I got lost. And and I'm sure that it, it, it also had to do that all those people were dead and in the little bottles. Uh -huh. So I guess, I guess that brought up in me the fear of dying. Uh-huh. Yeah. Can be, you know, that, yeah. Well, also like, you know, when we get older, we, 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 we forget things easier, you know. I, I can notice it. I'm now 65. I notice my short-term memory starts to, I don't remember names so well as before. And it I just start to notice it in the last few weeks, actually, that it, because it has happened a few times. Yeah. It's, you know, and then maybe when you saw the bottles, you saw the ashes, you know, and you also know that, the youngest person I can see, you know, just like me. 
so it might have you know brought up like some unconscious maybe a little fear or something you know even we think we are not afraid but somehow there is still something you know the uncertainty of it all yeah yeah and the thing is you know there's nothing we can do about all of those things but what we can do is we can meet it we can relate to it in a skillful way you know and what you were just doing i mean i think that's really skillful you know you share it with others who understand what you're saying and 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 then you hear you know that other people say well yeah i know that i have that too you know because that's what it what happens if you get older and it's not a personal shortcoming you know it's it's uh it's part of the way, you know, part of being a human being, right? Or maybe even a member, you know, they all have that to a certain extent. And and there's something we can do. We can train ourselves a little, you know, but we can't really make it not happen either. Yeah. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah. I think you were one thing. Well, okay the, there's somebody here asking what is the earth room yeah so the earth room or better said the aloka earth room is the place where i live in san rafael and i have a few cards here which i can put out at the end oh i wanted to bring some but i forgot i'm just like hmm. you see i forgot um yeah it's it's a place you know which i have uh kind of opened uh, a small uh, meditation place in, in San Rafael near Gersel Park. And How do you spell? Earth. Oh, so uh, the, the, the A L A L O K A Aloka. And maybe uh, uh, Tia, you can put it in the chat. Aloka Earth Room. Three words. A local restroom. And it's, it's a place, you know, it's a, it's a, what I call a contemporary temple space or a sanctuary, which weaves together Dharma, ecology, and art. You got it? I'm there. Are you? Do you live there in, 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 in San Rafael? No. No, I, I live in San Francisco, mm -hmm. but I used to live in Fairfax. Okay. That's but close. Yeah. I, I worked all around, uh, Marin County, yeah, and I, I was in a school-based program mm -hmm. that taught uh, environmentalism and mm -hmm. uh, how to build uh, art component. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also worked at the um, there's a clinic in the town of Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I did a postdoctoral uh, fellowship. There. Okay. The area. So please, you know, look it up. And I'm also happy to give you a card. And I'm usually open, you know, for the public on Saturdays. And I have given online teaching on Wednesday mornings. And sometimes on Saturdays, I'm not open. So please look at the schedule because sometimes I teach somewhere else. But it'd be nice to see you there. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I opened that earth room because I feel particularly called to support that narrative change, you know, because I think that takes care of, would care, would take care at the root, it strikes at the root of the problem, you know, and, and because of who I am and what I can offer, that's for me, I think the best use of my energy, because I think, you know, the Buddhist meditation is very much uh, a real good technology for under you know for support that change in narrative and for understanding you know what stands in the way for, for that to happen yeah so is there anyone else on the zoom who wants to nope okay so you know that brings us almost to the end and yeah it's much you know it's it's for me much easier because then i just don't want to just spill spew something out you know which nobody actually is is 
I don't want to do drama entertainment, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, I think the narrative is totally something where we can have an influence. You know, if we see that the narrative is giving birth to a lot of harm, you know, like, for example, environmental harm and other isms, you know, racism and sexism and everything what's happening, you know, then we, we can look at it and, and, and see, you know, uh, maybe there is, is something we are, we are telling ourselves about life and about who we are, which, which is maybe not really true, you know? And for example, you know, we say, for example, recently I was, this is a good example. I was at, uh, at Starbucks, you know, because I, I was going to teach in Sacramento and I was too early. So I said, okay, let me go to Starbucks and get a drink. And then I didn't have a cup. So I, I thought I'm, I'm just going to drink it in Starbucks. So I don't want to have a plastic cup. So I said, please, you know, put it in a, in a cup because I drink it here. And they said, we don't have those cups anymore. And then I said, you know, please, then at least don't give me a lid because then I don't have to throw it away. And then she said, but I have to give you a lid. And and then I said, but I don't want it. And she said, you just throw it away. And then I said, but there is no way. It's all where we live, you know? And she looked at me like that. Because she believed that you can throw something away, you know, means like away. And that's that's part of the narrative, you know? Thinking that there isn't a way, for example. And everybody thinks that. And that's one thing, you know, if that would be if that would be integrated that there is no way, it would make such a change to everything, how we live, how we consume, how we produce. I mean, really. Yeah. And it takes a long, you know, and it's, I see it more like, you know, when they built the cathedrals in Europe, it took several hundred years. The people who start to build wouldn't see the end of it. We have to take that that kind of a view. I guess uh, maybe it should have been a little more uh, because I think of like I mean, it's an ancient civilization for a lot. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just the thought that was it always just matter in the past when they were more connected to the earth? I mean, I think no. if, if the narrative of the constant just you know mm -hmm. the universe is spinning mm -hmm. a bigger turn. Like how did we get to this narrative? Are we saying that it was better in the past. No, I'm not saying it was better in the past. That's kind of what I meant about mm -hmm. the narrative. Mm -hmm. Like I have an influence on it because you know ancient civilizations have come and gone and cataclysms. And I mean, is this our Earth or is it just the Earth just doing what the Earth does? Basically, it's kind of what I'm getting at it. The narrative is just cycling through, just like the Earth cycles, the universe cycles. I think, you know, there, I think there is, there is definitely those cycles are going on too, you know, like the seasons and all of that, that's all going on. And, and I think, you know, in the Buddhist teaching, we are speaking about, I don't know if you've heard about the wheel of samsara. Have you heard about that? You know, the wheel of, of becoming as long, you know, as, as the mind stream is still, you know, conditioned by, by greed, hatred, and delusion, it will participate in that cycling, you know, and, and, and it, it's, it's just going to be repetitive. It's like, you know, if you look at the Egyptians and then the Romans and maybe the Aztecs, they all have had fights, they all have had intrigue, they all had kings and they all had slaves and they all had like, you know, they were going out and colonize other tribes and, and kill them and do all of, they were all doing the same thing, you know, but also you can operate inside of those cycles in a, in a liberating way, you know, like for example, the Buddha was also born as a, as a son of a king and so on and so forth. But then he used his mind, you know, to, 
to also to step out of that cycle you know and and that can only happen i feel like in relationship to your contemporary situation you know for example i am not living in rome or in greece you know ancient roman greece i'm living now so i have to kind of cultivate my good qualities in relationship to what's happening now on the planet you know and in my case what i feel mostly called to is like the whole issue of of the climate crisis because i can i for me it's clear that the climate crisis is is human it's not completely human made but it's it's exasperated very much by the way how we live and we could and i feel you know i feel responsible for future generations that I contribute something that they have a d decent way to place to live, you know, and, and I'm not thinking that I can fix all of this, you know, there's the cycling, I can't fix that, but I can contribute, you know, that there is less harm done inside of that cycling, because, you know, I can cycle through all of those you know, the seasons and everything without adding harm to injury, you know, or I can cycle and just give a shit about everything, you know. And that, and that at the same time, it also cultivates my mind and heart, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the thing is, you know, and doing it, you know, trying with all your might to fix it while knowing it cannot be fixed is better than knowing it cannot be fixed and get completely depressed and go down, you know? Because how you, how you, can, because you can only liberate your mind out of all of that stuff. And then, you know, everybody else, as long as they have this, can, needs to be done, you can't save anyone. But what you can do is you can help to make skillful conditions, you know, like this place here, you know, they could have made like a a, a, a place for dealing with drugs and alcohol here or a Dharma center, you know, and then what's better? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> you know, what what is better, you know, for, for having less suffering, you know? And that's, he made a good choice. No. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So thank you so much, everyone. And hello, Sheila. Nice to see you. Hi. Bye-bye. And next time, we'll see you on online only. Bye-bye. Thank you for coming, and thank you, Tia, for organizing it all for us. Thank you. Thank you, Wyatt. Thank you, everyone. Beautiful. Bye-bye.